Welcome to the Joy of Development. Today we'll be starting a new project focused on procedurally generated levels. We'll talk about some of the problems you might run into, as well as some creative solutions to solve them. We'll be focusing on grid-based level generation, which is great for all sorts of game types, especially roguelikes and dungeon crawlers. So without further ado, let's get started. For this project, we're going to be using the first person template, and I've taken the first person character and moved it into my project folder. Aside from the character, we have two actors, one for our room and one for our door, as well as a blueprint interface. For this episode, we're just going to be focusing on the room. We'll get to the interface, the door, and the character in the next video. Now I've already got one of my rooms placed in the world, and in its details panel, we've got a few custom variables to play with. If you increase the value of room tiles X, new platforms will be added to increase the room's length outward. Increasing the value of tile size X will space the platforms apart, which could be good for platformer games. And setting the value to a negative will make the tiles go in the opposite direction. Now trying to adjust the other variables, and nothing's happening, so let's jump into the room actor and get things functioning. Our room is made of only two components right now, one for the floor and one for the walls. Currently we don't see any walls, but if you select the wall component, go to its details panel, and add an instance, a new wall will appear. Both the wall and the door are known as instanced static mesh components. These are more computationally efficient than regular static meshes, especially when rendered in large quantities. There are two kinds of instant static mesh, a hierarchical instant static mesh and a standard instant static mesh. For the time being, we'll just be using the standard one but in the future we may use the hierarchical one. And the final thing to note is make sure you know the dimensions of your meshes. For example, on my floor I'm using the floor 400 by 400 mesh, and on the walls I'm using the wall 400 by 400 mesh. These two meshes come standard with Unreal Engine, but if you're adding your own meshes, make sure that you know the tile sizes and are prepared to deal with the dimensions. Now jumping into our event graph, you'll see we have one function running off event begin play. We also have the same function on our construction script, following a clear on our door actors array. For now, you can ignore the clear doors array, but the moment we start spawning doors, you should add this in. If you don't, the room won't update properly. This is also just for a live preview in the editor. Anytime you actually want to run the game, make sure you disconnect these two from the construction script. Now with that out of the way, let's jump into our basic room function. At the start of the function, we're going to be generating our floor. Right now, we only have it connected to columns, which is why we were only able to get a single row of tiles. We do this using a for loop, where the first index is set to 0, and the last index is set to our floor tiles x minus 1. We subtract 1 because we're starting our counting at 0. So to get, for example, 10 tiles, we would want to stop counting at 9. We'll then multiply our index by our tile size x, and plug that into the x value of a make vector. And we're multiplying the value of our tile size y by the index of a different for loop. Currently this one's not plugged in, so it's always going to be set at zero. And once again we're going to be plugging the result into our make vector into the y node. And this make vector gets plugged into the location of an add instance of our floor. Now let's plug our input node into the row for loop. This for loop is the same as the other one, except that it runs off room tiles y instead of room tiles x. It then goes into the second for loop, creating a nested for loop. Putting everything together like this will allow you to expand your floors in two dimensions. Back in the editor, if we increase our room tiles y, you can see that now the level expands in both directions. After our floor is all set up, we want to introduce some walls. Spawning the walls will also use for loops but they won't be nested. Instead, we'll have two independent for loops spawning the walls parallel to each other. The first of these two for loops will be spawning the top and the bottom walls. You'll also notice a new function here. You don't have to worry about it just yet. For now, just think of it as an add wall instance node. For the bottom wall, we're going to multiply the index of our for loop by the tile size y and plug that into the y value for our make vector. Then we'll leave all of the other values empty and plug that into the location. And for the bottom wall, we're going to want the rotation to have a yaw of 90. Now jumping back to the editor and sizing up our room, and we can see that the wall now spawns along the bottom row. 
For the top wall, we're going to do basically the same thing with a few minor changes. For one, we're going to multiply room tiles x by the tile size x and set that to our x value. Doing this will put all of these walls on the top end of the room. We also need to add one to our index before we multiply it by room size y. And we do this because we're going to be rotating it by minus 90 degrees. Now if we jump into the editor, we can see that there are walls on both sides of the room. If we scale things up and split them apart though, you will see that there's a slight error happening. And this is one of the first issues. However, I'm not planning on building anything right now where I need separated platforms, so I'm not going to worry about this. It's more important that we have the walls rotated appropriately so that when we spawn new levels, they spawn on the right side of the wall. So I'm keeping all of their orientations facing outward. So with the top and bottom now complete, let's move on to the right and the left. Our right wall is going to have a rotation of zero, and the setup will be similar to the top wall. The only difference is we won't be adding one to the index, and we'll also need to swap out the y's for the x's and the x's for the y's. And quickly back to the editor, you can now see that we have a wall on the right side of the room. And finally will be the left wall. This one will be simple like the bottom wall, except on this one we do need to add one to the index. And like the last one, swap out the y's for the x's, and make sure to leave the y value blank in the make vector node. Switching the yaw rotation to 180 degrees, and we're all set. With all the walls complete, we'll hop in the editor one more time, and you'll see that we have walls on all four sides of the room, and we can scale them as needed. Now it's time for us to look into adding some doors. So let's hop back into the room actor and open up the wall or door function. As you can see, it currently only adds instances of walls, but we're gonna take the true pin of our branch and plug that into spawn actor door. After spawning a door, we're gonna add it to our doors array. When adding an instance, we can just use local space, but when we're spawning an actor, they need to be spawned in world space. To do this, we're going to use a transform location and transform rotation node using our actor's transform, plugging the values in like so, and the actor will spawn appropriately in world space. Next, we're going to be randomly selecting walls that we want to convert to doors. We're going to be using a random boolean with weight from stream. What this node does is allow you to provide a seed number for a random value to be generated from. This way, every time you give the same seed, you get a predictable result. What the weight value means is that the higher percentage this value is on a scale of 0 to 1, the more likely it is to come back true. To get our weighted value, we're going to be taking the length of our doors array, as well as our door count, and subtracting the length of the array from the door count. We'll then divide the result by the door count, and this will give us a percentage. The more doors we've spawned, the less likely it'll be for another one to show up. Now we plug it into this AND node, and then plug the AND node into the branch. Now, a wall will be a door only if it's selected to be a door and capable of being a door. Jumping in the editor, scaling up the room, and increasing our door count value, you can see a bunch of chunks of wall disappear. No doors are currently spawning, however, and that's because you can't spawn actors on the construction script. Now let's jump back into our basic room function, and figure out exactly what can door is. We have our index going into a modulo, and then that modulo checking if the value is equal to another. If the values are equal, that spot's capable of being a door. I set this up to make sure that no doors spawn right next to each other. They'll always be spaced at least one wall apart. But if we promote both of these to variables, we get even more control over our room's door distribution. And the final thing we need to do for our rooms is create an entryway check. For the origin room, we want walls to cover every bit of the sides. But for any new room, we need to make sure that there's a wall missing at the entry point so that we can pass through. So on the bottom wall, if the index is zero, we don't want to spawn a door or wall unless it's the origin room. The way I've phrased it here in code is if the room is the origin, or if the index is not equal zero, then spawn a door or wall. If not, just skip to the top wall for this index. Now back in the editor, we can see that if we switch the room's origin variable to false, 
the bottom wall's first tile disappears. Now with the room all set up, let's give our gameplay an actual preview. To do that, we need to go into our construction script and disconnect it from its current functionality. Also make sure your event begin play triggers the basic room function. We'll set our origin room's dimensions to 8x8 with a possibility of up to 6 doors spawning. And now when we preview the game, we'll be able to walk around in our room. Our doors are all spawned and appropriately placed, and we'll be going over those in the next video. For now, this has been the joy of development. Be sure to subscribe, hit the bell icon, and smash that like button.